Welcome, welcome. Um, my name is Ted Peterson, and I am a professor of computer science at the University of Minnesota Duluth. And today is Tuesday, May 31st, 2016. And it's a special day here uh, in Duluth. Uh, it is the Alan Turing Festival of Books. Not a book festival, mind you, it's a festival of books. Um, and uh, it's a pretty small scale affair. I, I, I'm sad to report it's pretty much just me and you and I'm going to talk about some books that I've been reading uh, about Alan Turing um, recently. I've, I've spent quite a bit of time in the last six months or so uh, reading about Alan Turing and, and his, his work and, and have just found it really fascinating and uh, realized that I was probably reaching the end of this kind of binge that I've, I've been on. And so I wanted to record some of the, uh, mention some of the books that I've read and some of the things that I've learned about Alan Turing's life, because it, it's a really fascinating uh, story. Um, so who was Alan Turing? Why, uh, why, why am I reading about him? Well, this is, uh, if you want to picture Alan Turing uh, in your, your mind, that's a, that's a nice photo of Alan Turing, I would say. Kind of an impish, impish grin, um, and uh, uh, looks like a kind of friendly fellow here. Um, so that's what Alan Turing looked like. Um, Alan Turing was a mathematician, a computer scientist, a computer engineer, philosopher, um, uh, who in a short life um, really founded computer science uh, and, and, and gave us the notion of, of what a computer is and can do really uh, in a very formal and rigorous way that we've been able to build upon. Um, he did that in his early 20s uh, as, a, as, a, as a young man of 23, 24 years old at Cambridge University uh, in, um, in England. And uh, after that, uh, he was, like many others, swept up in World War II and, and spent World War II um, uh, working uh, on behalf of, of his country, uh, England, Great Britain, uh, working on breaking the Nazi Enigma Code, for example, and then going on to do some work in encrypted speech, which is just kind of amazing to think about, uh, given the time. Uh, after World War II, Alan Turing uh, became involved in some of the very first efforts to build a, a working stored program electronic computer. Um, uh, we didn't have working stored program uh, electronic computers until about 1948, actually, and that's something we'll talk about a little bit more. And Alan Turing was in on the ground working on that. And um, once a stored program uh, computer became available, Alan Turing started using it, and not just for equations and, and, and you know simple stuff. Um, he was designing programs to play chess, uh, for example, um, and. He also uh, began to think about what does it mean uh, for a machine to think? And he, he posed an intriguing problem. Uh, he called the imitation game, we now call the Turing test, where um, can we have a computer that can actually, in a dialogue, fool a human being and to think that it too is human? And what does that mean, uh, uh, you know, both for the limits and nature of computing, but also what does it mean you know, to be a human and to communicate. What is it that we are uniquely looking for that distinguishes our human-to-human -human, uh, computing? And so a whole lot of fascinating questions arise. Um, and even towards the very end of his life, he was involved in computational biology uh, and, and doing, again, some kind of fascinating work. And so uh, all of this within just under 42 years. Um, Alan Turing um, died in 1954. Um, and uh, uh, by most accounts uh, took his own life. He, he committed suicide. And um, so with Alan Turing, we, d we didn't get that period, you know, we, you, sometimes we have these great scientists, these great thinkers who later in life begin to reflect. You know, they talk about how it was to be there, how it was to do this and so forth. They give talks and speeches and people clap and all that kind of stuff. And Alan Turing never had that. Uh, he had this enormously productive life, and then it was over. Um, there's a plaque um, uh, outside of his house, uh, outside of Manchester, England, uh, in Wilmslow, where he lived the last few years of his life. Um, and it gives kind of a neat biography. Born in 1912, uh, died in 1954, um, and uh, is said to be here the founder of computer science and cryptographer, uh, whose work was key to breaking the wartime enigma codes. Uh, lived and died here. And 
That's a reasonable summary. I mean, it, it, if it's on a plaque, there's a lot of detail there that we want to flesh out. Um, and some things about Alan Turing, the man, that are interesting. Um, one thing that's kind of fascinating is that he was a, an Olympic class marathon runner uh, in his late 30s. That's Alan Turing crossing a finish line somewhere, uh, looking quite fit, uh, good form there. And he uh, ran a marathon, a 26 mile race, in uh, I think his best time was two hours and 48 minutes which go out and try and do that that's hard uh, that's that's a that's a it was a time that came close to qualifying him for the Olympics in 1948 I believe uh, but I think he had some injury issues and stuff wasn't able to do that but that's a fascinating thing to think about what if what if Alan Turing was an Olympian in addition to all these other things uh, it's kind of amazing um, and so um, so that's what we want to talk about and we're gonna uh, talk a bit about um, some books that I've been reading uh, that, that have kind of motivated me to, to, to share some of this. Um, and so uh, the place where we have to start when we talk about books about Alan Turing um, is this biography, uh, Alan Turing, The Enigma by Andrew Hodges. Wow. Um, this book came out in 1983 and it is a remarkable biography. Um, there's another video that I did where I talk about like three good books to read about the history of computing. This was number one. Um, and this is just a great biography. And if you read one thing about Alan Turing, this is it. Um, and I think if you're interested in computer science, computing, philosophy, any of these things, you should read this book. Um, this is a great book. It, 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 it it takes the whole of Alan Turing's life from beginning to end and doesn't duck the technical issues, right? It talks about his theoretical work, his, his code-breaking work, um, his work with building computers in, in a way that is accessible and yet it doesn't trivialize it. So this is a remarkable book. Um, if, you, if you go to the bookstore today, which I hope you will, and look for that book, you might find it looking kind of like that. Um, and so, of course, there was the uh, rather popular and, and interesting movie uh, from, I think, 2014 uh, about um, uh, the Benedict Cumberbatch um, film, The Imitation Game. Um, and this is the cover of the book. Uh, this is the cover of this biography that came out as a movie tie-in with that book. And there you see not Alan Turing, but Benedict Cumberbatch, which I've found kind of disturbing because... Um, I don't know. I guess this is what happens, you know, when you when you enter popular culture and, and almost become a kind of mythic figure in a way. And Alan Turing, I think, is on his way or is at that level. Um, the reality of even what you look like changes, um, and we see that uh, this 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 kind of fascinated and horrified me. Um, this is a, a cover from Time Magazine, the Genius issue, and it talked about um, Alan Turing, but among others, but that's not Alan Turing, right? That's Benedict Cumberbatch. And so we're taking, uh, I mean, Benedict Cumberbatch is a handsome man. I mean, he's, you know, I mean, maybe Alan Turing would appreciate being rendered this way, but Alan Turing himself, uh, you know, that's, that's a, a very popular uh, or commonly seen photo of Alan Turing. You could put that on Time Magazine, and I think people would still buy it, right? Um, and that's actually... You may see that. That's the photo I have back behind me here. I'm having a hard time figuring out how to do this. Um, and actually, above above Alan Turing there, um, you you see it's not as clear maybe, but I'll, I'll show you a close-up, if you will. Um, this is um, Ada Lovelace, um, who we'll see has a kind of, um, uh, what, time-traveling relationship with Alan Turing, I would say. And, um, and she's another favorite. Um, I'm, I'm currently starting an Ada Lovelace reading binge, so you can expect me back to talk about that. Um, but anyway, this is, a, this is a portrait of Ada Lovelace um, as a young woman uh, playing, uh, playing, the, playing the piano, I believe, or maybe the harpsichord, which was popular at that time. Um, and uh, she was, uh, we'll hear more about her today, uh, but she was um, indeed one of the original thinkers about computing and had a very uh, astute um, 
uh, understanding of the nature of computing even before computers existed. I mean, a remarkable woman. Um, and so that uh, explains some of the photos. Um, so, um, so we've mentioned this wonderful biography. Uh, you should run out and get this. Uh, I know the Duluth Public Library has a copy. The University of Minnesota Library has a copy. Your library probably has a copy, and your bookstore does too. This book has been in print since 1983, and I suspect it will stay in print for a long time. So you can find this book. Um, uh, read this book. Um, and so um, now if you read that, and I, I read that. I actually read that. I, I, I read that book earlier this year, and maybe that's kind of what started this. And I'd, I'd read it years ago, actually, um, but um, reread it and realized there was so much more I wanted to know. And I started to look around for other books and um, found a lot of interesting material that is kind of what we're here to talk about. And um, one, um, so there are a number of other biographies available. And um, one of the ones that I enjoyed the most, I think, was, uh, was this book. It's called um, Turing, Pioneer of the Information Age by uh, Jack Copeland. And um, there's actually a YouTube video of the same title that if you look for that, uh, you'll see about an hour-long lecture by Jack Copeland where he kind of talks about a lot in the book, uh, a lot in his book. Uh, this is my copy of the book. It's not my copy. It's the University of Minnesota uh, Twin Cities campus copy of the book. It doesn't have the nice, pretty cover on it, so I'm showing you that in case you want to see. That's a, that's a happy touring. That's a, that would be great on Time Magazine. I don't know what the problem was there. Um, but this is a this is a really interesting book uh, because a lot of what we know or think about Alan Turing in terms of especially from the perspective of computer science is his theoretical work, which we'll talk about, um, and also his his work during World War II in in uh, in, in working with the Enigma codes, uh, breaking the Enigma codes of the Nazis to some extent, um, and we kind of pass over a lot of his. Um, uh, efforts to build, for example, a stored program computer after World War II and program that and so forth. And so, so Jack Copeland's biography gives us a, um, a picture of Alan Turing uh, almost more from kind of an engineering point of view and, um, and talks about um, uh, really some of Alan Turing's struggles in, uh, in, in, in building his machine. Uh, he went after World War II to work at the National Phys Physical Laboratory in London and um, was charged with building a computer, uh, a stored program electronic computer, um, but struggled in managing life in an in a, a, a organization. Uh, he, he appeared to have some difficulty in accepting the authority of people who were not as smart as him, which was pretty much everyone. Um, and so he, um, uh, he was also a bit standoffish and so forth. And so despite being very brilliant and knowing how to do these things, um, he ultimately left the National Physical Labor Laboratory after a couple of years with his computer not built. Um, it was later constructed, a computer known as ACE. It was later constructed. Uh, but Alan Turing went then to Manchester uh, to work uh, with Max Newman, uh, who was leading an effort there to build a stored program computer at Manchester, which was successful. And so by about 1948, Alan Turing had access to a stored program computer and began to do some of this very fascinating work uh, programming that and, and thinking about the limits of computing and so forth. And a lot of that is described in this, in this book. This, this book. Um, it's an interesting book as well because it, it focuses quite a bit less on Turing the man. Uh, Turing uh, has an interesting personal story. Uh, he was a bit of a loner as a child and, and subjected to quite a lot of bullying. And uh, His parents were distant. It's a rather sad story. Um, he also uh, was a, a gay man uh, during a time in England when that was in many other places where that was illegal. Just to be gay and acknowledge that and, um, and, and live that life. And, and he was relatively unapologetic about that. Um, it, it, it seems that uh, he regarded that this is just my nature and I, this is how I am. I, I can't be any other way. Um, as, as we probably know, this, this of course led him into trouble with the um, British government uh, where he was ultimately arrested for 
gross indecency was, I think, the charge for essentially having a relationship with another man. And um, uh, led to a conviction and a sentence of chemical castration, uh, where he took female hormones for a year in an attempt, a very misguided and cruel attempt to essentially sort of diminish or, cruel, uh, or cure his some homosexuality. This, th these are remarkable, horrifying facts uh, that, that I think we have to come to terms with. Uh, this book doesn't get into that. Um, the Andrew Hodges book does. The Andrew Hodges book, which I'm going to get back here, the Andrew Hodges book does get into those issues, and it talks about them in a very, um, a very moving way. I mean, I think we, 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 we see something about Alan Turing, the man, that in the end is very moving um, and, and ultimately very tragic. Um, it's largely unknown why he committed suicide. There was no note, no explanation. Um, there's quite a lot of speculation about that, which we'll talk about as we get along. But, um, uh, but in any case, uh, Alan Turing, the man, is well described here. Alan Turing, the scientist. Alan Turing, everything is described well here. Um, you can get other books like this one that will give you some more details about, for example, in this case, how his efforts to, to um, you know, build, build computers, uh, and also about his theoretical work as well, but primarily the working life of Alan Turing and not the personal life. Now, one thing you may find yourself, this is, you know, I found myself in this situation. There are numerous um, uh, papers by Alan Turing uh, that, um, um, I mean, you can find most everything on the internet right now and stuff, but, uh, but his work had such a, a broad scope, it, 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 it's sometimes a little hard to find uh, it all together. And so there's actually, this, this is actually a very nice collection of Alan Turing's um, most interesting and significant uh, papers. Uh, and it's in a collection that was edited by, again, Jack Copeland. Um, it also includes, for example, the transcripts of a, a radio program that he was on towards the end of his life, talking about whether or not computers can think. Um, and so this is a real nice sort of one-shop uh, source of Alan Turing's most significant work and papers. And so if, if you find yourself uh, wanting more details um, about some of the technical aspects, this is a nice place to go to. Um, there's also, I believe, some, um, not everything here is written by Alan Turing. I think there are some um, uh, other um, papers that describe, for example, the Enigma codes and things like that. So you get, you get some nice background here. So this is kind of a more technical or scholarly treatment of Alan Turing's uh, life. Um, so um, on the other end of the spectrum, perhaps, is, is, is this. It's a graphic novel about Alan Turing's life. This is pretty recent. Uh, this is called The Imitation Game, Alan Cur Turing Decoded. And um, it's by um, Jim Adebiani, I guess, um, illustrated by Leland Purvis. And it's, um, I, I just, I, I stumbled across this at the Duluth Public Library. Uh, a lot of the books I'm, I'm gonna show you are from the Duluth Public Library or the University of Minnesota Library, so Thanks again for being a good library or good libraries. Um, but this is this is it's it, it's a graphic novel that that tells the story of Alan Turing's life. It's sort of uh, and it it touches on both the, the technical work and the personal story, and it actually uh, tries to address the technical issues as much as you can in a graphic novel. So it uh, it it's actually uh, initially I was deeply skeptical when I saw this. I thought, oh my gosh, this is going to be weird. But it's actually kind of nice. Um, I enjoyed it. Um, and there are some things you can do in a graphic novel that uh, I think are, are wonderfully fun. One of the, one of the famous, to me, um, episodes, if you will, or periods of Alan Turing's life is when he, uh, when he was at, at Cambridge. He um, uh, sat in on various different classes. Um, and I think this was after he had finished as an undergraduate, so he was a, a research fellow. Um, and one of the classes he sat in was with Ludwig Wittgenstein, you know, scary, fearsome Wittgenstein. And by all accounts, Wittgenstein and Turing engaged in a sort of dialogue during this class that pretty much left, left everyone else sort of scrambling to keep up. And um, it's an extraordinary thing to think about, because um, if you ever 
you know, if you read about philosophy, um, Wittgenstein is, 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 is wonderful um, because he's so unique and so um, such a contrarian in some ways. And, and, uh, um, and, and I think he sh Turing shares that kind of quality, I think. Um, Alan Turing worked in a kind of isolated way, was very unique, very original, somewhat like Wittgenstein, right? And so that they might get along uh, in some way doesn't seem too far-fetched. Uh, but anyway, there's just a very small scene in this graphic novel, like two, two, pa two, whatever they call these things, boxes or whatever, where Alan Turing in the black hair there, I guess they all have black hair, but Alan Turing here is listening to Wittgenstein talk here, and uh, uh, it says, so I was teaching and taking some classes as well, some philosophy with Ludwig Wittgenstein at Cambridge. And then Wittgenstein says, if you do an experiment to see what re result a set of rules leads to, this is only an experiment so long as the rules do not prescribe what they have to lead to. That's actually pretty sound if you think about it. Turing says, I see your point. Wittgenstein, I have no point. That's just like classic Wittgenstein. Uh, uh, you know, just like you agree, and then he says, no, no, I didn't mean that. Um, so uh, I'm not sure. I love the looks on their faces. So this is, kind of, this is, a, very, this is a very nice book. The other thing that I really enjoyed, and I, I really um, appreciated, was um, we'll see, and I've alluded to this kind of dialogue across time between Alan Turing and Ada Lovelace. And this, this graphic novel actually includes that. It actually um, shows them together, which I love. Um, I mean, they died. I mean, they lived. Uh, Ada Lovelace died uh, in the 1850s, I think. At the, no, it was before then. She died long before Alan Turing uh, was even alive. And so this is a sort of speculative reimagining of something. And I just found that to be really charming. It's the kind of thing that, um, that, that I, I myself like to think about and imagine. Um, so um, more books, more books. Um, the, uh, if you're, this is actually a pretty nice book here, The Innovators by Walter Isaacson. And you'll see actually on the cover of this book, another Duluth Public Library book, uh, that, that you see here, Ada Lovelace and Alan Turing. And so by my standards, this is already a good book. Um, but what it does um, is it, 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 it takes kind of a broad picture of the development of computing, starting with Babbage and Lovelace and their difference um, analytical engine um, and working up through the theoretical foundations of Alan Turing and then moving on into the modern era. We see, see here, of course, the, you know, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and, you know, slightly less fascinating to me. Uh, but you can find discussions of Alan Turing in, in most, a, a reasonable history of computing and computer science. We'll talk about Alan Turing. It's, it's a pretty glaring omission if they don't. And this is actually a pretty nice one. Um, if you're looking for just kind of a, I don't want to learn everything about Alan Turing, but I'd like to understand how he fits into the bigger picture of computing. This is actually a pretty nice book. I, I, I enjoyed this book. Um, I think it did a lot of good things. Um, there, there are other biographies you can find. One that has kind of a, I don't know, I think it's kind of a almost, a, not sensationalist title exactly, but it's just kind of a, like an espionage sort of title. Um, the Man Who Knew Too Much, Alan Turing and the Invention of the Computer. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure why it's called that. Um, you'll see that this is actually a rather sparse book, um, and it really just kind of touches on the biography of Alan Turing. It's kind of like a, a re very reduced version of the Andrew Hodges uh, biography, where it does talk about both his life and his theoretical and technical work, and it, it tries to provide some details about that. And this, um, it's it's a nicely written book, actually. It's a um, uh, the author I saw was, I think, a professor of creative writing, which is kind of nice. And there's some literary flourishes, if you will. Um, the book starts by making some comparisons between um, Alan Turing and the, the lead character in a film uh, that starred Alec Guinness uh, called The Man in the White Suit, um, and how they were both um, kind of undone by their success and so forth. And yeah, it's kind of interesting to think about and stuff. And so it's th this is a... Uh, you yeah, know, this might be worth a look, especially if you're looking for something to give you a biography, but maybe you don't want to 
as quite a as 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 rich a read as the Andrew Hodges book. Um, so uh, so 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 keep an eye out for this um, at the Duluth Public Library. Probably going to return it later today, so you can get you can get it if you're in Duluth. Have a library card. Um, so I'm not going to mince words here. This book kind of drove me crazy. Uh, Turing's Cathedral by George Dyson. There's nothing wrong with the book, um, but except the title. It has so little to do with Alan Turing, and it is, in fact, a, uh, a rather glowing portrait of, of John von Neumann, uh, who was a, a, a mathematician, an early uh, uh, you know, kind of pioneering figure in, in computing and computer science, uh, to some, a kind of slightly notorious figure, um, uh, he, uh, in 1945, published a very influential paper, or released actually kind of a, a draft of a paper that became hugely influential uh, called the EDVAC Report. And the EDVAC Report kind of described the design of a stored program electronic computer. And I guess we should say what a stored program electronic computer is. A stored program electronic computer is a computer that where you can keep both the program and the data that the program is to be operated on in memory. And the computer can essentially carry out any task that can be programmed without any modifications to the hardware. And so this was not true of early computing devices, like the famous ENIAC was not a stored program computer. That was, it was a, in many ways, a very large electronic calculating machine. You had to rewire it to, to reprogram it. Um, and so it didn't have that stored program capability. Now, the designers of the ENIAC, uh, Mockley and Eckert, uh, Alan Turing himself, all, I think, had the idea of the stored program computer. Um, I mean, it's clear Alan Turing did because he, uh, I think, uh, in, in his earlier theoretical work, as we'll see, really kind of introduced the idea. So clearly he understood it. Mockley and Eckert seem to have too. But John von Neumann released this working paper uh, with himself as the sole author. And he had clearly been collaborating with Mockley and Eckert, uh, had had some interactions with Turing in the past. Uh, and uh, because of that paper, it was a, a very clearly written paper. I mean, it's a good paper. I mean, John von Neumann was brilliant. But as a result, he got a lion's share of the credit for the development of the stored program computer. And in fact, we call stored, pro stored, stored program computers now are often referred to as von Neumann uh, architectures or von Neumann machines. And, um, you know, for some, that kind of doesn't feel right. Um, and so um, that's why I say he's a kind of controversial figure. Now, he was an energetic, uh, brilliant man, worked extremely hard on behalf of his country, the, the United States, he was, I think, from Hungary, but uh, emigrated, worked extremely hard during World War II uh, to develop computing, to, to develop the atomic bomb, was unapologetic about the atomic bomb, unapologetic about the EDVAC report, you know, said these are things that had to be done, um, atomic bomb to win the war, EDVAC report to make computing possible, to, to share ideas widely, um, you know, it's 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 it. You can kind of see, uh, you know, a reasonable philosophy there, and it might just be the the, the crediting of that that has left some people the wrong feeling, um, a little um, uncomfortable with him. He's worth a biography. John von Neumann deserves a biography, and it's it's like this. It's just this title. Turing's Cathedral. There's a chapter in the book called Turing's Cathedral. It comes like page 250 um, where, where there's some introduction to Alan Turing, but it's like otherwise this is a book about John von Neumann. So I'm going to give George Dyson the benefit of the doubt here and say that this was like a marketing decision because um, this book came out around the 100 year anniversary of um, Alan Turing's uh, birth and so maybe that was that. Um, so but it's if you're interested, I mean John von Neumann and the work that he did developing uh, the computers at Princeton University, the I Institute for Advanced Study, uh, was um, uh, early on developing stored program computers. Uh, they were actually quite late um, in, in having a working system. Uh, and this book doesn't really talk about the people that were first, who were primarily in England. Um, uh, Morris Wilkes at, at Cambridge and EDSAC. 
um, and Max Newman at Manchester, the Manchester baby, I mean, are, are barely mentioned here. So it's kind of a, a curious book in a way. But if you're interested in John von Neumann, which maybe you should be, uh, this is kind of a nice book. Now, before I leave you with a, a kind of a bad taste about John von Neumann, I, I have to, there was one rather charming aspect here of John von Neumann. I don't know how well this is going to work, but um, in the photos here in this book, and this is, I hadn't seen this photo before, but this is, yeah, I'm not sure how this is going to work. Um, this is a photo of some, I think, primarily men going out to ride horses. And John von Neumann is at the back there, uh, not only wearing a suit, um, but facing the wrong way. And it's it's rather charming. I, I don't know that you can see that very well. And I, I looked around. I, I did a few Google searches like John von Neumann horse backwards and stuff. I didn't find this photo online, but it's it's a, a rather charming thing in a way in that, you know, a man that goes horseback riding on a suit facing the wrong direction. I mean, he can't be all that. Um, and indeed, John von Neumann died relatively young in the 19, in, I think in the 1950s. He was in his mid-50s, and I think died of cancer uh, because of exposure radiation during all of his work at Los Alamos. So, you know, we, we, we shouldn't be too tough on him. Um, and, uh, and so that's a good book, just has the wrong title. So it doesn't quite fit into our festival of books here, but we'll let it, we'll let it be there for a while. Um, so, um, so those are kind of some of the overviews you can read about Alan Turing, the, 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 the talk about the scope of his life, his work. Um, if You may find, like many people, you want to drill down on one particular area. And so Alan Turing first um, rises to prominence as a young man, uh, aged about 23, uh, at, just finished at Cambridge University, um, studied at King's College. And he wrote a paper, um, this paper, uh, called On Computable Numbers with an Application to the Entscheidens Problem. And this is a remarkable paper. It's impenetrable. I have found it to be very difficult over the years. Um, but uh, this turns out to represent really kind of the founding of computer science. And, and within this paper contains a lot of the key ideas that we rely upon today, including the stored program computer. Uh, this was published in 1936, so well before any of the actual efforts to build stored program computers, which started more so after 1945. So this was really pioneering. This was a bolt of lightning uh, because Alan Turing was young, unknown, and he learned in a, a class with Max Newman about a famous problem, uh, this uh, Entscheidens problem, which I'm going to call the decision problem from this point on. I guess that's the translation from German. I'm going to call that the decision problem. And this was a problem posed by the famous mathematician David Hilbert. Uh, and it, 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 it basically asked the question, is there uh, an automatic procedure that we can follow to let us know if a problem, if a mathematical problem, uh, is uh, uh, can be solved or not. And it's not precisely phrased like that, but that's the basic idea. Can we can we look at a problem ahead of time and say it has a solution or not? And David Hilbert was engaged in an effort to tr to kind of try and solidify the foundations of mathematics, and so that was one of them. Um, is are, are there these kinds of um, almost mechanical procedures that we could compute by hand, that we could do by hand, to tell us if problems are solvable or not. Um, and I think the, con the consensus was that, yeah, yeah, there is. I mean, that, that mathematics is decidable, that we can, we can reach these kinds of decisions. Um, now, um, just a few years before Alan Turing's work, um, uh, Kurt Gödel took on another of David Hilbert's problems um, and, and showed that, 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 you know, basically mathematics was um, incomplete, um, that, that you couldn't actually prove everything from the first principles that you define in, in mathematics, which is kind of a shocking, uh, a shocking result to Hilbert and his uh, confederates and, and to mathematicians generally. Uh, and Kurt Gödel will come up a, a little later in our conversation here. He was an, another brilliant man, a very kind of eccentric fellow, uh, it seems. Um, but 
here comes Alan Turing on the heels of Kurt Gödel saying that, well, no, not only is mathematics incomplete, it's also not decidable. And so we're rocking the foundations of math here. And what's so interesting about this paper and what's so amazing about it is that Turing's goal was to answer that question about the decidability of mathematics. To do that, he introduced a theoretical notion that we now call a Turing machine, which is a theoretical conception of a computer that is very simple, just a paper tape that moves back and forth over a reader, uh, and the, uh, there's a device that can write or erase ones and zeros on it. And Turing shows that with even that simple a, uh, a, 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 a device, a model, uh, anything that you can compute, anything that can be computed. And in fact, all the computers, the computer that I have sitting next to me, the computer you're watching this on, all of that, um, are equivalent to a Turing machine. Um, that, In other words, a Turing machine could do exactly what your desktop or laptop is doing. It would take a lot longer, and there'd be a lot of paper tape used, but it could do it. Um, and that's kind of extraordinary. Um, I mean, just that result is extraordinary, and the fact is he introduced that almost as a side effect. I mean, that's a way to prove this thing about mathematics. He wasn't setting out to found the notion of computer science, but he did uh, while he was solving a math problem. And it's amazing. Um, now, as I've said, this is, this is a challenging paper. This is, this is Alan Turing at age 23. Um, you know, bringing it, right? I mean, uh, this is not easy to read. I've struggled with this for quite a while. Um, and if you ever come to my funeral, which I, I hope you will, um, you'll see me clutching this in my right hand if I ever understood it, and my left if I didn't. So I'm going to work on getting it over the right hand here. Um, there are some nice books that can help you, help, have helped me. And let me mention a couple of those. Um, this, this book, I really liked. It's called The Universal Computer, uh, The Road from Leibniz to Turing, and it's by mathematician Martin Davis. And you see on the cover here um, uh, the, the portraits of famous mathematicians um, kind of leading up to uh, Turing in a sense. Um, uh, Leibniz, Boole, Frege, Cantor, Hilbert, Gödel, and then Turing. And what this book does is it takes you through the development of math and logic through these people and shows how Turing, in a sense, is building on all that and how the idea of a universal Turing machine, which is the theoretical model of computing that we use today, how that uh, really has a rich mathematical and logical tradition. And we sometimes lose sight of that, especially in computer science. We, we're, we're a little... Uh, a little sloppy about that sometimes, and so this book does a nice job of describing these advances, and it does a very nice job of describing the broad outlines of Alan Turing's remarkable paper. Um, uncomputable numbers is a, a shorthand for uh, how it's sometimes referred to. And one of the fascinating things about this paper, the, the, the bolt of lightning aspect of it, is that Turing uses uh, Cantor's ideas about infinity and, and, and countable, uh, countably, uh, countable sets of, of numbers uh, as a part of, uh, as a key part of his um, proof. And um, this book does a nice job of introducing that, and then as you get to Turing's work, it becomes even more accessible, um, and so forth. Um, and so the, the very general idea that's expressed in this paper that I'm going to try and express is that the, Turing is trying to answer the question about this decidability question, the decision problem. And he introduces the, this theoretical model of computing, a Turing machine, um, that uh, uh, can be um, uh, solve any problem that's computable. And he represents these machines as integers. And since they can be represented as integers, Cantor showed that the set of integers um, is, is countable. It's enumerable. And, and so while it's infinite, we can also count them. And, th and there are certain kinds of um, uh, things we can show and prove based on that. And so what Alan Turing does is he, he, he constructs this machine, shows that they can be represented as integers, and then shows that the Turing machines can themselves take as input other Turing machines. And that's the stored program concept, that a, 
that a computer itself, a computer program, can be input to another computer program. And that's a stunning um, idea. Um, the, the, and, and again, remember at the time he was doing this, 1936, what did we have for computers? Very little. We had some work with electromechanical relays uh, and things like that to do special purpose calculations. We didn't have any kind of general purpose computer. None existed. Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace had, had talked about that um, in the 1830s, um, building essentially a steam-powered engine that could do a general purpose computing and, and, and Alan Turing was clearly aware of that but they never were able to construct those machines and so Alan Turing is you know laying on a field and in, in, at, at Cambridge looking up into uh, space imagining these machines and these machines taking other machines as input and from that we, uh, we, we he introduces what later became known as the halting problem and that that term was actually coined by Martin Davis, author of this book. He came up with the term halting problem. And the idea was that could you have a computer that could take as input another computer and tell you, uh, or another program if you will, and tell you if that program is going to compute uh, or going to end without running or not, without running that program. And um, this should remind you a bit of Hilbert's decision problem, and that's what Turing was doing. He was kind of casting the decision problem using his Turing machines um, and, and shows through Cantor's method of di diagonalization that you can construct um, a set of Turing machines that are uh, in the so-called halting set of a Turing machine, um, that is, that they will, um, th they will stop. When, once you start running those Turing machines, they will stop. Um, but then he also shows that you that that set of halting machines is not in the halting set, and it becomes this. It's a proof by contradiction, and it's as you start to realize that and understand that it's 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 kind of breathtaking i mean it's 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 such a a stunning kind of leap of imagination uh that it it just leaves you kind of in awe um and so i mean that's why this is one of these papers there's some papers in life that are hard to understand and you don't worry about it this is a paper that's hard to understand but i feel bad about it um, and so i'm working on it um the decision problem was also simultaneously and actually slightly earlier um, also uh, solved by um, Alonzo Church, um, American uh, logician, mathematician at Princeton, who Alan Turing actually worked with. Actually, Alonzo Church was Alan Turing's doctoral, dis uh, doctoral dissertation supervisor after this paper was published. But Alonzo Church's um, method and proof were, were very different. And, and so while he proved the decision problem, uh, before Turing even, uh, a few months before, it didn't introduce this rich kind of computational infrastructure that we've come to rely on now. So, uh, so, so that's why you know, Turing's paper is so extraordinary, both from the point of view of mathematics, and then, wow, we get computer science as a side effect. I mean, that's, that's great. Um, so once I graduated from Martin Davis's book, I started working on this one. Uh, this is a book called The Annotated Turing. And as it says, a guided tour through Alan Turing's historic paper on computability and the Turing machine. This takes you line by line through this paper. And it explains it, and it does a really good job of that. And so this is, for me at least, an essential companion to this at this point. So I, I keep these two together, and I kind of keep slogging away at it. Um, so... Um, that's, by the time Alan Turing was 25, 26 years old, he had, you know, helped redefine the nature of mathematics and essentially laid the theoretical foundation for computer science. Um, extraordinary level of accomplishment at such a young age. Um, all of this work was done at, um, when he was at Cambridge. Um, some, well, some, he was at Princeton for some period of time before World War II. Um, but a lot of his major work um, was done at Cambridge. 
uh, this, this paper, for example, the uncomputable numbers paper, uh, was written while he was at Cambridge. And uh, he was, as mentioned, affiliated in, as a student and research fellow with King's, uh, King's College. And here's, here's a, a view of King's College. That's me, um, slightly younger, uh, you know, me. And you see the famous uh, uh, King's College chapel um, in the distance there. There it is. Uh, and, and King's College uh, around there. So, uh, so I, I sometimes imagine Alan Turing sort of laying on the grass here, you know, thinking, looking up at the sky and thinking of these great ideas. Um, so, um, so that um, uh, gives us a feeling for, for what Alan Turing accomplished as, he, as a very young man uh, before you know, 25, 26. Um, if he had left mathematics and, you know, opened a hat, hat shop or something for the rest of his life, we'd still be talking about him and he'd be famous and important and, and so forth. But he went on to do more. Um, and um, uh, World War II uh, for England uh, and Europe uh, started in, in, in 1939. Um, Alan Turing was in England at that time. He had been at Princeton, but had come back, and um, was uh, uh, recruited to work uh, for the um, uh, British government in uh, cryptography, breaking of codes, breaking uh, in particular of the Enigma code. Um, and Enigma was a code that the Nazis used for much of their sensitive communications. Um, and in particular, they used it to um, communicate with the U-boats that were kind of encircling Great Britain and attacking the, the shipping and passenger and military transports and really causing a lot of misery, a lot of death, a lot of hardship, um, obviously for the people on the ships, but also for the people living on the island of, of Great Britain. And it was a, a, a terrible crisis. Um, and um, Andrew Hodge's book actually does a really nice job of talking about the Enigma years. Um, and so I don't have a specific sort of recommendation for the for Enigma uh, period other than the Andrew Hodge's biography. So I think if you're if you're really interested in wow, what was that like? What what was how did an Enigma machine work? How did they break the codes? Um, all these kinds of things. Andrew Hodges does a wonderful job with that, and I think that's why the movie tie-in existed, because the movie, as we'll talk about, really focuses a lot on Alan Turing, the codebreaker, at Bletchley Park. Um, and so we hear a lot about Bletchley Park. Uh, I guess it was an old manor home or whatever that was uh, bought by the British government or commandeered or what have you. And if you look at, uh, if you look at a map of England, I've, I've, I've I've helpfully, um, there's Bletchley Park right there. And what you'll notice is that it is uh, somewhat equidistance, equidistant um, between Cambridge. So um, Cambridge is there where Alan Turing was. And also um, Oxford. Oxford is somewhere over here. Um, there we are. And uh, yeah, we don't do rehearsals or anything, so I just, I just go. And so anyway, um, very centrally located to sort of the, the, the centerpieces of, of, of British higher education and um, apparently very mysterious to the local residents. I think the story was that it was like a, um, uh, an asylum for, for the uh, lunatics, as, as they were called at that time. And so we wouldn't call it that. But it, it was kind of looked a bit like that. That's the main, the main house. And it became this massive operation with thousands of people working there. Um, breaking codes. Um, and uh, you can visit there. I, I haven't visited there, actually, which, which, which I'm, I'm disappointed in myself for not having done that. But you can, you can go there and visit, and it's apparently quite a nice experience to go there. Um, you can see this statue of Alan Turing and that iconic photo. That's him with his Enigma machine or working on the Enigma machine. Um, and you can see a lot of the uh, artifacts of that period. Um, Alan Turing... Um, one of his main sort of contributions or ideas uh, for breaking Enigma was um, uh, taking this idea of a electromechanical kind of code breaking machine that was called a bomb, uh, B-O-M-B-E. And this was something that actually the, the, in Poland they had developed, but uh, Alan Turing I think was aware of that and, and, and that idea kind of 
was taken to Bletchley Park, and he was among those who um, kind of worked on the, the design and creation of these bombs. And the idea was that they began to realize that the, the Nazis included certain sort of stock phrases in many of their messages, like weather reports would begin with, the weather is, um, and maybe a, a certain kinds of communications would end with an obligatory sort of Heil Hitler. Um, and so what they realized was that if they could guess where these kinds of stock phrases are, they could really reduce the space of possible encryptions. And so they would guess where these stock phrases were. They would call them cribs. And they would, they would set these bombs, um, these, these electromechanical calculating machines, to, um, uh, to f uh, assuming that their guess was right and that, that the settings of the Enigma machine must be set this way to get Heil Hitler out of this little phrase, this little encrypted phrase. Um, and then the, the bomb would essentially go back and reverse engineer what the other settings must be uh, so that the message could be fully decoded. And they had thousands of these bombs, I think, each one working on a particular setting for a particular crib. And so it was, in a sense, a kind of distributed a uh, parallel computing effort of, of huge uh, scope, but successful, right? It was very successful um, and, and provided crucial uh, information and assistance to the British government throughout World War II and was certainly a key factor in the successful outcome of the war for the Allies. Um, and so, um, uh, as I say, I think uh, uh, you know, Alan Turing's Enigma work is very well described in that Andrew Hodge's book. I, I, I don't, I think you should just read that if that's, if you're interested in cryptography and stuff, read that. Um, there's another part of the Bletchley Park story that has only more recently come to light. Um, and this is um, uh, a system that Alan Turing was not too directly involved with, but is still important. And it's, a, it's an electronic uh, computer called Colossus. And Colossus um, was, uh, it, it was not an electromechanical device. So an electromechanical device has magnetic relays in it that make a lot of noise. And they're, they're electromechanical, so they're not moving like at the speed of light, you know, like electronic computers are. They're moving at the speed of how fast a magnet can be attracted, uh, you know, to a, a contact. Um, and so there was another code that the Nazis used um, that um, uh, called Tunny that the British also wanted to break, of course. And so um, uh, there, there was another figure kind of under, I think under, uh, not, not well known enough, uh, uh, code breaker named, named Bill Tutt, who was kind of working on Tunny and was, had some ideas about how to, how to solve Tunny or how to, how to break it. But they, they required com computation on a massive scale. And so he kind of said um, to Max Newman, actually, a uh, Cambridge man who uh, was very active in the uh, development of electronic computers later at, at, at Manchester, working at Bletchley Park, Park, basically saying, if I had this kind of electronic device, we could break Tunney. And so Max Newman said, OK, let's build it. And so they did, and, and Colossus was a true electronic uh, computer. It was not programmable, but it was electronic. It wasn't electromechanical. It used vacuum tubes. Uh, it was a special purpose code breaking machine, but it was just, it was not any less capable than ENIAC. ENIAC is the system that only became operational in, in 1946 in the United States, and ENIAC is often said to be the first electronic computer. Uh, the fact is, though, it wasn't a stored program computer. It was, in many ways, a kind of electronic calculator um, that you reprogrammed by resetting wires. And so um, Colossus was, in a sense, an earlier version of that with a different focus but a similar kind of philosophy and design. Colossus was, however, kept secret for many, many years by the British government, kept secret up until you know, even the 1970s, 1980s. And um, I, I think among the reasons for that is that they were still using some of the ideas for breaking breaking codes after World War II. 
Um, and so Colossus has only recently kind of started to get the attention that it probably deserves. Uh, one place that it, it gets that, um, this is our friend Jack Copeland again. Uh, Jack Copeland is a very kind of prolific Alan Turing and his time scholar. And this is a book just called Colossus, um, The Secrets of Bletchley Park's Code-Breaking Computers. And this, this is another University of Minnesota library book you can... Um, Actually, this came from Gustavus Adolphus College, so via interlibrary loan, so thank you for that. You can tell these university library books always lose the really nice covers and stuff, so, um, but, um, but this book contains a collection of papers that describe how Colossus works and what it did, and it's a, it's a worthwhile thing to understand because especially now as the mythology surrounding Alan Turing grows, which isn't a bad thing, I think it's perfectly wonderful actually, there's a danger, though, that other people um, and other achievements are going to be left out. And Colossus may run that risk. Um, you know, Bill Tut in breaking the, the, the Tunney Code uh, doesn't get nearly the recognition. Um, and um, uh, Tommy Flowers, the designer of Colossus, is, is a somewhat unknown figure and so forth. And so, um, so that's why it's, it's sometimes important to kind of maybe move past the mythologizing a little bit and look at the actual life and times of these people. Alan Turing still accomplished great things, but other people did really great things too. And so Colossus is kind of a, you can kind of think of Enigma uh, and the bombs and Colossus and Tunney as bookends, if you will, on the Bletchley Park um, story. Um, and, and a fascinating story it is. Um, and so... Um, Alan Turing worked on Enigma for the first few years of World War II. Interestingly enough, uh, uh, after World War II, he went, or during World War II actually, spent a little bit of time in the United States working at Bell Labs and uh, was working on speech encryption and other kind of interesting problems like that and then went back to uh, Bletchley Park and, and so forth. So he had kind of a, a, a rich experience of, of, uh, uh, of, of research and work during World War II. Um, after World War II, as I've mentioned, I'm um, going to rearrange some books here, um, he became very, um, his goal was to build an electronic stored program computer, as, as along the lines we've described. And this makes perfect sense. Theoretically, he describes the idea in um, uh, his uh, uncomputable numbers paper. It's there. He clearly understands it. Uh, he gains a lot of experience working with electronics and electromechanical systems, vacuum tubes, valves as they're called in, in, in Great Britain, um, during World War II. And so it seems perfectly natural that after World War II, he'll want to build one. And he does. And so he um, uh, kind of happens upon uh, the National Physical Laboratory, which wants to build a stored program computer. They hire him, bring him in to do that. And we kind of described this a little bit before, but um, he ran afoul of his superiors, if you will, the administrative folks above him, and, uh, and was perhaps a little difficult to work with um, uh, as well, those around him and under him and so forth. He was a loner. Um, and so, uh, and, and didn't seem to have the kinds of skills that you need to deal with people in authority. I mean, we have all had this feeling, right, that the people who are above us are incompetent, they don't know half as much as we do, all this kind of stuff. There's, it's a natural sort of human thing, I would say. And we learn how to deal with that, right? And Alan Turing wasn't willing to do that, wasn't able to do that, and that led him uh, to some frustrations at the National Physical Laboratory with ACE um, and later towards the end of his life, not that much later, but towards the end of his life, um, his dealings with the police um, were really kind of inexplicable unless you remember that he just wasn't willing to um, kind of compromise uh, or, or recognize when uh, there are people who have authority, uh, rightly or wrongly, they have it. Um, and so we have to work with that. Uh, but this period at the National Physical Laboratory is very interesting because what we see is Alan Turing, the computer architect, Alan Turing, the computer engineer. And there's another book by, guess who, Jack Copeland, uh, another collection of papers, actually. So it's edited by Jack Copeland that um, 
talk about different aspects of the ACE design. And ACE was a, was a stored program computer for certain. And um, there were various groups that were trying to um, uh, build the first working stored program electronic computer, uh, many of them in England, actually. And so there was Morris Wilkes at Cambridge working on the EDSAC. Uh, there was Max Newman in Cambridge working on what became known, I think, as the Mark I, uh, also referred to as Manchester Baby, I believe. Um, and Alan Turing at National Physi Physical Laboratory working on ACE. And Alan Turing had these kind of personality traits that maybe led him to some difficulty. There were also some technical decisions that, um, that, that slowed them down. And um, with a stored program computer, obviously the key, a key, is memory, right? You got to get the program and the data in memory, and you got to be able to retrieve it reliably uh, in order to run it. Um, and ACE, Alan Turing's project, uh, committed to the use of, um, um, the name is, the name is escaping me, um, it, it, mercury delay lines. Um, I, I kept thinking of something else that I knew was wrong. Mercury delay lines. And so mercury delay lines were an early form of memory for computers that were actually, it was actually a pretty reasonable, reasonable idea. You would represent the value of your program or your data as a series of pulses, and you would send those pulses through a tube, a big tube of mercury, and mercury has the property that those, those pulses will create waves, and those waves stay relatively steady, and so you can pulse your program into the mercury, and it'll exist in there as waves, and then you can read out what you have in memory on the other end, and you can keep cycling your program and data around um, until you're ready to read it. So it's, it, 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 it's kind of a almost beautiful way of thinking about memory. It's unfortunately very challenging to implement, and there were, there were a lot of problems with the mercury delay, mercury delay lines that slowed ACE down. Now in Manchester, um, um, Max Newman, uh, used, instead of mercury delay lines, um, a, a kind of vacuum tube known as a Williams tube, uh, developed by the, the famous uh, British engineer Freddie Williams, that essentially used a cathode ray, ray tube to record, again, the, the, the values that represented a program uh, or data. And so it would uh, almost be like um, projecting an image onto a television screen or a computer monitor and then saving it there. And Williams tubes were more reliable and faster and um, certainly that helped Manchester get to the point of having the first the, the first stored program was run at Manchester I think in June 1948. Alan Turing moved to Manchester soon after that because I think he was fed up with you know, the situation with ACE, and just he wanted a stored program computer to work with. At the time he wanted to do that, none existed, and so he built. He wanted to build one. Once one existed, it made perfectly good sense to just go there and work with it. Um, now, we should also mention that Morris Wilkes at Cambridge was working on that. There was some, I think there was some kind of animosity or whatever between Turing and Morris Wilkes, and there's a very famous quote, um, which I, I'm not going to read to you, but I'm, I'm just, that Turing was commenting on Morris Wilkes' uh, design for EDSAC and said something to the effect that, um, well, this is an interesting but different kind of conception of, 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 a, of a stored program computer. Um, it, uh, it seems to rely a bit more on the American uh, sensibility of solving problems with equipment or hardware uh, rather than using actual thought. Uh, and uh, I just thought that was kind of a delightfully uh, barbed comment uh, from Alan Turing, anti-American. So we'll, we'll forgive that. Um, but it's reflected in his designs, though, for ACE, is that it was, th the goal was to simplify the hardware and do more with software. And it may have been that at the time the hardware wasn't up to that. I think we see that to some extent in more modern computing now, like in RISC architectures. Uh, that's been kind of a fundamental idea. Keep the, keep the instructions that your system natively um, supports relatively simple. 
Um, and uh, we also see that in, in the idea of microprogramming, where we have maybe a small set of atomic operations that a computer can carry out, and then programs uh, at a very low level that um, uh, use those to um, implement other more complicated kinds of instructions that then programmers use. And so I think Alan Turing was, was thinking in a way that uh, was probably well advanced uh, from the hardware that he actually had available at that time. And so uh, a very interesting period in Alan Turing's life, though, these years at ACE and NPL. And, and so it's, it's, I think, well worth looking at that because I think that we lose track of Alan Turing, sort of the computer engineer, the builder of computers, given all of his other n numerous accomplishments. Um, so Alan Turing went to Manchester, um, 1948, and began working uh, with... Max Newman uh, and, and in the computing laboratory there, if you will, uh, using their stored program computer. Uh, as mentioned, uh, was designing programs to um, play chess, was thinking about other kinds of very challenging problems, actually, given the hardware of the day, kind of very challenging, hard, uh, very challenging problems. Um, and he also, um, by about 1950, had been thinking about what does it really mean to have a computer think? And computers, back even when he was at NPL working on ACE, were e mentioned in the popular press as sort of electronic brains and things like that. And so there was this, this, um, uh, th this, this kind of uh, hope for these machines that they could do so much. And Alan Turing really thought about that. And you can, this, I mentioned a radio interview where he talked about kind of the nature of uh, can, a, can a computer think? And you, you see discussions of that in some notes of earlier talks. But um, where he really brings these ideas to fruition is in this paper. This is a 1950 paper um, and uh, just called Com Computing Machinery and Intelligence by A.M. Turing. And this is where we get the Turing test. And um, Turing did not call it the Turing test, right? He called it the imitation game. Um, which was the title of the Benedict Cumberbatch film, uh, which wasn't really too much about the imitation game that we see in this paper, but I think there was more like a metaphoric kind of thing going on there that maybe we can talk about. Um, but in this paper, he starts just by saying, I propose to consider the question, can machines think? And he goes on, uh, this is 1950, and, and you know we have mercury delay lines and paper tapes and stuff, um, and so he's thinking way beyond where computers are at. Uh, and he goes through th some discussion of the question and then basically says, well, the question isn't really well formed. And so says, instead of attempting such a definition, I shall replace the question by another, which is closely related to it and is expressed in relatively unambiguous words. And that's where he gives us the imitation game. And the idea of the imitation game is you have a human judge and then two subjects who are concealed from the judge. Uh, he can't see them or hear their voices. They communicate via teletype or kind of a chat, if you will. And one of those subjects is a human being. The other is a computer. Both the human and the computer engage in a dialogue with the judge to try and convince the judge that they are human. And, um, and, and so Alan Turing said that, you know, c could computers reach the point where they could fool a human judge, you know, let's say 70% of the time. Um, and so he talks about the test. He also does a really nice introduction for, of, of what a computer is. Uh, because at this time, 1950, a lot of people didn't actually know what an electronic computer was. The word computer actually referred to a job of a person who would go into work every day and do calculations. And so he goes through a very kind of accessible and um, uh, rigorous yet um, discussion of what it means to, what is a computer? And he talks about kind of a, essentially a sort of discrete state model of computing, much like we talk about in computer science and sort of lays out that. And then he talks about various objections, possible obje objections to the idea that, well, what would it mean if a computer program could fool a human judge into believing it was human? What, why is that significant or not? And so he went through nine objections to the imitation game. 
and, and tried to kind of argue them from both sides, and I think in the end kind of was concluding, well, the imitation game seems to have some validity. And this is really a charming, uh, this, this paper is really so accessible, and, and I think you get such a sense of the personality of the man that this is really, you know, I think if you're interested at all in, in, in Alan Turing, um, just as a, as a person, uh, this is well worth reading because it's informal enough where I think we see traces of a, a really kind of interesting personality. Um, and so one of the objections that he talks about, he refers to, he calls it Lady Lovelace's objection. And this is a really interesting thing. Lady Lovelace, Charles Babbage and Ada Lovelace, as mentioned, back in the 1830s, uh, were working on the designs, if you will, for analytical engine. Ada Lovelace working on programs for said machine. Machine was never built. Um, but Ada Lovelace uh, wrote, um, she translated some remarks by Charles Babbage and then added extensive endnotes to that, which has become our best description of the analytical engine. And that paper, Ada Lovelace's paper, was sort of known but sort of not known. A lot of people were unaware of it at this time. Alan Turing clearly knows about it because he essentially cites it here. And he also, um, uh, he, he, there's a kinship there that I feel. I, I, maybe I'm projecting too much there, but, um, but I think you see there um, this dialogue that I've been mentioning. And so let me read just a little bit here. Um, Alan Turing says, our most detailed information of Babbage's analytical engine comes from a memoir by Lady Lovelace. In it, she states, the analytical, the analytical engine has no pretensions to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. And so this is talking about kind of the limits of computing and making uh, you know, how this would relate to the imitation game is essentially saying that, well, no, I mean, a computer program is not, we're not going to be able to say that it thinks because it's just doing what we tell it to do. Um, and so Alan Turing goes on to kind of discuss and debate that point a little bit. And um, he also goes on to say something which I think is really important. And he says, the analytical engine was a universal digital computer. And so here's Alan Turing kind of reaching his hand across the hundred years that's separating him from Lady Lovelace and Charles Babbage and, and saying, yes, you designed a true digital computer, a stored program computer. Um, so a strong endorsement there uh, that goes on to say so that if its storage capacity and speed were adequate, it could be, by suitable programming, be made to mimic the machine in question. Um, and so he's, he's providing a kind of equivalence here between the analytical engine and this stored program notion, uh, which is a, a strong endorsement indeed. Um, he goes on to talk about a variant. Uh, he says a variant of Lady Lovelace's uh, objection states that a machine can never do anything really new. Um, and then there's some you know, discussion of this, and, and he goes on to say something which is quite intriguing, and that is, machines take me by surprise with great frequency. This is largely because I do, not, I do not do sufficient calculation to decide what to expect them to do, or rather because although I do a calculation, I do it in a hurried, slipshod fashion, taking risks. Um, then he goes on to say, naturally, I'm often wrong, and the result is a surprise for me. For by the time the experiment is done, these assumptions have been forgotten. These admissions lay me open to lectures on the subject of my vicious ways, but do not throw any doubt on my credibility when I testi testify to the surprises I experience. That's kind of an interesting notion that you know human beings are surprised by lots of things, sometimes maybe the consequences of their own imperfections. Um, and so there's a, there's a kind of an interesting subtext throughout this paper about humans and about the nature of how original are we, um, what does it mean for us to be surprised? What does it mean to be creative and things like that? And so regardless of what you think of the imitation game, it's led to a fascinating dialogue since then between philosophers, computer scientists, anyone uh, who thinks about computing and uh, computers becoming more verbal and you know being fooled by a computer into thinking it's human and vice versa, maybe thinking that a human is computer. And so it's led to this fascinating kind of discourse. Um, 
This is the paper that um, Alan Turing is referring to, the, uh, the sketch of the analytical engine invented by Charles Babbage. And as mentioned, uh, Ada Lovelace translated some remarks um, uh, that were recorded uh, by uh, uh, Manabria, uh, who attended a lecture of Charles Babbage um, in Italy, and she added these wonderful endnotes. And I'm not going to go through these in, 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 in any detail. There's, a, there's an Ada Lovelace festival of books coming up, I'm almost certain. Um, but just to give you a, a little taste of Ada Lovelace's uh, thought um, and why she strikes me and I think so many interesting, um, uh, she says the following uh, in her notes. Um, uh, it is desirable to guard against the possibility of exaggerated ideas that might arise as to the powers of the analytical engine. In considering any new subject, there is frequently a tendency first to overrate what we find to be already interesting or remarkable, and secondly, by a sort of natural reaction, to undervalue the true state of the case when we do discover that our notions have surpassed those that were really tenable. It's a very sort of reasoned view of, of technology and how we tend to get so excited by, oh, it's new, ah, it's going to change the world. Um, and then we kind of miss what it's really good at. Um, so, so I think she has this spot on. Uh, and then this is the quote that Turing is referring to. The analytical engine has no pretensions whatever to originate anything. It can do whatever we know how to order it to perform. It can follow analysis, but it has no power uh, of anticipating any analytical relations or truths. Its province is to assist us in making available what we are already acquainted with. And so that's kind of the, the source of the Lady Lovelace's objection. And I think it's a fascinating dialogue, um, you know, to imagine this kind of conversation between Lady Lovelace and Alan Turing. Uh, that's kind of what's happening behind me there. They're, they're talking through time. Um, and so, um, the Turing test has spawned a huge literature. Um, there are many kind of academic papers and collections. One that I think is particularly worthwhile is uh, just called The Turing Test, uh, Verbal Behavior as the Hallmark of Intelligence. Uh, this is edited by uh, Stuart Cheever, uh, uh, computer science professor at uh, Harvard, uh, and has a lot of interesting, um, a lot of interesting content uh, to think about here, so uh, so so we we get into a lot of discussions of the Turing test. If you watch TV and whatever, you see that. Um, if you study natural language processing, you talk about the Turing test. It comes up in the first few pages of this very fine textbook that I myself use and really like, um, the Jurafsky and Martin speech and language processing book. Uh, Turing test gets us started. Uh, and why is that? It's because it's captivating and it's engaging. And I think it's a good way to get anyone interested or even anyone forced to take a natural language processing class even. Maybe you can reach them through that. Um, another book that I've read quite recently actually, like in the last day or two, um, called The Most Human Human uh, by Brian Christian. Um, this, this is kind of an interesting um, uh, kind of big idea book that uh, was based on the author's experience participating in the Loebner Prize. And that's an annual event that brings together programs that think they might be able to pass the Turing test. And it sets up a Turing test environment with a judge and a computer and a human uh, participant uh, called a confederate that um, engage in a dialogue with a judge. And if, if a, a machine ever uh, passes or is judged to pass the Turing test, they win a really big prize. Um, and so this is an ongoing event. And, and Brian Christian's perspective here is interesting because he was involved as a human confederate. And so he was trying to convince a human judge that he's a human being. And this leads to a lot of interesting sort of philosophical questions is what, what is it we do when we're talking that makes us human? And, and, and so right now I'm talking, I'm waving my hands around, you can see me, you may have some reasonable presumption that I'm a human, but what if I were talking to you via chat, a chat window and it was just text? What is it I would say or do that might convince you that I was human? Uh, or that I felt some empathy, that I, that I felt some emotion about something you were sharing with me? How could you know that or would you know that? And could a computer sort of fool you into thinking it felt those same things. And it's, it's a kind of a disturbing thing to think about because there's some discussion in this book that I, I, 
that, that had to do with really how scripted we are as human beings sometimes. And in particular, it talked about like, you know, speed dating. And there are these people that kind of have these pickup schools where you learn how to meet men or women or whatever. And, and they give you little scripts to follow. And they work. I mean, you know, they work to an extent at least. And so it's kind of like, well, how human is that? Um, and so there's a lot of musing about these kinds of issues, um, and, and this is one example of that. There are, I'm sure, numerous others, but since I've read it recently, I thought I would share that. Um, so the last stage here of this festival of books, um, kind of our, our, closing, our closing session, if you will, um, I just wanted to mention a little bit about um, Alan Turing in popular culture, fiction, these kinds of things. And of course, the starting point for that has to be this, right? The 2014 film, The Imitation Game. And I recently w watched it again. And the first time I watched it, I remember being very distracted by certain kinds of what I felt were inaccuracies. For example, one scene which really stuck in my mind was when Joan this isn't giving anything away important either. So Joan Clark and um, Alan Turing, Joan Clark was the woman that, her code breaker as well, Alan Turing proposed to but then didn't marry. Um, they were talking about these bombs and describing them and she was kind of giving a little recitation of what it meant to be a stored program computer, which was kind of interesting and in retrospect maybe it's a good thing to expose people to that, but the bombs were not stored program computers. They were electromechanical calculators and that just kind of stuck in my head and I thought, ah, how can a film that takes those liberties be worth watching? And I watched it a few more times and I actually kind of like it a lot more. Um, I think the recreation of the bombs is fascinating uh, because they're noisy. And what does that tell you? It tells you they're electromechanical devices. Electromechanical devices are noisy as heck. Um, and um, I think, you know, the, the, the movie was filmed, I think, at Bletchley Park itself, so you get a good sense of what that place was like. And it certainly recreates the drama and excitement uh, and, and fear, really, uh, that existed in World War II. Um, it doesn't really address Alan Turing's um, sexual orientation terribly directly. Um, he talks about not liking girls and not marrying Joan Clark, but it's not really the focus of this film, and, and that's fine. He had a, a big, complicated life, and there are lots of things left out of this movie. Um, it, you know, I think it, it's the kind of movie that if you like espionage movies or World War II movies, Regardless of what you think about computer science and Alan Turing, you'll, you'll enjoy this. You know, if you haven't seen it, I think it's worth seeing. Um, and uh, I mean, how often does a, a founding figure in computer science have a movie made about them? Um, so, so we ought to support that. Um, an earlier film based on a play is kind of interesting. I just wanted to mention that. It's called Breaking the Code. And this was um, a play and a film, I think, made in the 1980s. Uh, and Derek Jacoby is uh, here, plays Alan Turing. And this movie is much more about, um, and, and it's based on a play. This is the script of the play, which I've read. And it, it, it has a lot more to do with Alan Turing the man and Alan Turing um, the, the, the gay man. And so we see in this film Alan Turing with men and embracing men and all of these things that don't happen in the imitation game. And um, uh, it, it, both films, however, start with this scene of Alan Turing having been arrested, being interrogated by the police. Uh, well, no, not being arrested. Him going to report a burglary of his house, a kind of trivial burglar, burglary with nothing of consequence taken. But, but he was uh, not, as we mentioned, real astute in dealing with the authorities. And, and this burglary, burglary offended him, uh, it seems, and he felt he had been taken advantage of by a young man who he was involved with, and so he went to the police to report it. And in the process of doing that, ended up confessing to having a homosexual relationship with a young man, which gets you arrested and charged. And both films start with that, and, and then engage in flashbacks to kind of talk about his life, why he was important. And um, um, you know, that's certainly um, a crucial turning point or moment in Alan Turing's life. Um, and I think the effect of that has been to kind of link 
his suicide to that experience of being arrested, losing his security clearance, undergoing chemical castration, leads him to suicide. And that certainly seems like a plausible theory, but whether or not that's true, we just don't know. He had finished the treatment for chemical castration, and by some accounts was reasonably laconic about it, um, but we don't know. Um, and so that's maybe part of what's intriguing or interesting about Alan Turing the man, is, is, is what really led him to take his life, if he did. Um, and so we see in, uh, in this book, another book I've read fairly recently, um, called Fall of Man in Wilmslow uh, by uh, David uh, Lagerkrantz, another Duluth Public Library book there. Um, this book starts with Alan Turing's death. And it kind of follows uh, a fictionalized account of one of the detectives investigating his death and in the process confronting some of their own feelings about class and where they've ended up in life um, for the police sergeant and so forth. And then also kind of exploring a bit about Alan Turing, talking a bit about his work, explaining it fairly well in the book, uh, and also making the point that at the time nobody knew what Alan Turing did during World War II. It was not known that he worked on Enigma or Breaking Codes. That was still a secret. And so the police are kind of operating in this fog and, and this, this, this uh, sergeant kind of slowly starts to unravel that. And, and, and we start to see introduced some alternative theories that, well, perhaps he died accidentally, perhaps he died as a kind of a cleanup operation by some security service or something like that. And I won't, I won't go into any more details about that in case you decide to read it. This is actually a much better book than I expected. I saw the book, I saw the title. It's got an apple. Alan Turing is said to have killed himself by eating an apple. He dilled, dipped in cyanide. It's an apple on the cover. And then this title is very kind of grand title, isn't it? Fall of Man in Wilmslow. But it's actually, I've enjoyed this book quite a lot. Um, and so, um, and it, it kind of gets into this discussion of how uh, and why Alan Turing died. Uh, I should also say that Jack Turin, the Jack Copeland biography that I mentioned very early on, um, Pioneer of the Information Age, includes a chapter at the end that, um, again, kind of raises questions about was it suicide, was it accidental, or was it some sort of plot? Um, and I think Jack Copeland seems to be leaning towards the idea of an accident. Uh, Alan Turing was an experimenter. He was a bit of a, a, a sloppy experimenter. And so the possibility that he might have poisoned himself somehow, I mean, maybe it's out there. Yeah. Um, and so perhaps it's likely we're not maybe going to, going to know. Um, and so um, I guess I'll, I just have one other, one other fiction, work of fiction here that I've, that I've read uh, called A Madman Dreams of Turing Machines. And this is a, 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 a book by uh, the author, uh, John Levine, uh, John Levin, perhaps, is a mathematician and clearly understands Gödel and Turing and their work. Uh, and she kind of alternates chapters between Gödel and Turing and uh, uh, describes their lives, some of their difficult experiences, some of their breakthroughs, and then their ends. And Kurt Gödel was a, a deeply troubled man, it seems. He, he was a hypochondriac, convinced everyone was going to poison him, so kind of paranoid and things like that. And um, I enjoyed this book. It, it's one of these books that if you ask me what it's about, I wouldn't know exactly what to say other than it's kind of about Alan Turing and Kurt Gödel, and it does a nice job of describing why they're important. Um, I did find the juxtaposition of the two a little um, troubling in that Gödel was clearly mentally distressed, if not mentally ill. I don't think Alan Turing was. Alan Turing um, was a, a quirky, maybe difficult if you were his boss kind of person, but um, seems in many ways to have been able to uh, you know, manage the world and, and, and live a, a healthy kind of life, very physically fit and so forth. Um, and, and so the, 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 I don't know if the juxtaposition is meant to imply anything in that direction, but it bothered me a little bit. Um, I'm not exactly sure the title, The Madman. I'm not sure what madman we're talking about here. So, um, uh, but I found this, I was at the Duluth Public Library again, and I was looking for Turing, and I found, oh, it's a, a novel called A Madman Dreams of Turing Machine, so I got it. And um, so this will be going back, too, so you can check this out if you're in Duluth. Um, so 
I think that's a good place to stop with the Alan Turing Festival of Books. Um, I, I hope that you've seen something here that might be of interest to you. Um, there is a vast literature about Alan Turing and all of his, these ideas, um, and also about his life. He's become a, a, a significant figure in the terms of uh, rights for, for, for gay people and lesbians and so forth. And, uh, you know, has so, so has kind of assumed this kind of mythic quality. He's, um, he's kind of, um, uh, you know, we're creating, we're creating Alan Turing as we uh, write all these books and novels and films and so forth and, and reimagining him and um, maybe assigning him ideas and motives that he didn't have even. But that's, that's the nature of myths, right? And so, um, so I think it's important if you find yourself intrigued by that, to go back and look at some of the kind of more source material and maybe learn a little bit more about Alan Turing. He's a delightful figure and, uh, I mean, so exciting intellectually and so intriguing as a personality. I think it's, I think it's time really well spent. Um, so thank you. Uh, if you watched all of this, wow, thank you. Um, and uh, we'll see you soon.